really excited for this one. We got Patrick Herb joining the show. We're going to talk about this Badgers basketball team heading into March and football. Football is starting. We're going to talk about all that and more on today's Locked On Badgers. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Lockdown Badgers. Thank you so, so much for joining us. As always, really, really do appreciate it. Uh, And I'm excited about this one. We somehow convinced Patrick Herb to come on and do another show. He's slumming it with me. Uh, Patrick Herb, the Director of uh, Communications and Brand Strategy for the University of Wisconsin. March Madness, man. We're here. We're on the precipice. How are we feeling? Love it. This is is one of my favorite times of year. Even if I wasn't doing this job, I would, I'd love this time of year. I love college basketball and, um, Last weekend, the conference tournament weekend is super fun. And then this weekend, even better. Like this, Yeah, this is the greatest time of year. I love it. Let me ask you this. So last time you came on the show, my buddy Mike, who lives on Connecticut, big badge fan, texted me. He's like, man, what a job Patrick has. <laughs> it, I was curious. It got me thinking, how did, is your day-to-day impacted, like, for example, during the February slump, right, where the Badgers struggle, you're going in every day to work, or, you know, this, this run in the Big Ten, or is it not really impacted that much for you? my mood is impacted like you know there's like there's a cloud that hangs over when things aren't going well like no matter what sport like we had some rough weeks in football this past season and it's just everybody's a little bit down right and then and then the opposite when the team's flying high and they've won nine straight and they're number six in the country like oh, this is pretty good um the, but the work actually doesn't really change um you know we still there's a routine to Game is over. You wrap up that game. There's another game coming. You have to prepare the same way. All of the games are on TV, so it's not like some have a bigger spotlight than others. Um, when you're really good, there are more requests upon you from media members and from um, you know people who want to help you get attention or want to use your success for attention for themselves. So sometimes it can there can be more to manage that way. Um, but also on the flip side, when things aren't going well, sometimes it's when you have to be more creative and and find ways to uh, spin it. I speak at so we have a <clears throat> locally who here we have what's called the overtime club, and it's a it's a booster club for the men's basketball program, and uh, or sorry, it's the, the Badger men's basketball booster club, and they have overtime lunches is what I should have said, and I speak at each of those lunches. They're once a month. And I kind of just give an introduction of coach guard, then he takes questions, and I usually try to fill it with some information and some stats and so it's easy when the team's number six in the country and killing it but it's a little tougher when it's not so that's when you got to get creative and figure out like all right what is there still to sell about this team and what are we still proud of what were those meetings like kind of in that february swoon good like that group is really positive like that's a group of of friendly faces right those are people who are who donate to the program who believe in the program through thick and thin. And so they're not challenging at all. And coach guards really good. He's really good at that kind of stuff. He speaks well. He has a humility about him. He also has a awareness. Like when things aren't going, like I get it. Like we're not, we're not playing the way we want to be playing. And, and here's some of the reasons why, but here's what gives me optimism that the same team that was number six in the country is in those uniforms and we got to get through this. And we got to lock in a little bit better, but we can come out the other side. And that's the kind of message he delivers. And so far, it's kind of truthful. <laughs> Based it, on last it, weekend. Yeah. And let me, because I've, I've kind of compared it to a baseball season, right? Like in the middle of the summer, you have the, they call it the dog days. And you might have a team that loses 10 out of 14 and still go win the pennant. It mm-hmm. kind of felt like just the dog days of college basketball. But it feels like we're seeing shades of that number six team from early in the year. It feels like we're much closer to that version now. You know that the Big Ten tournament one was was phenomenal. How are you? Yeah, they feeling? played four. They put together four really good performances mm-hmm. in in Minneapolis. It wasn't just like truthfully. Truth be told, I would have been if we'd have gone there and beaten Maryland and Northwestern and bowed out to Purdue in the semis. I would have thought, all right, good. We got a little mojo back. Like we got some wins and Northwestern's a tournament team, so we proved we could beat a tournament team on the neutral floor. Like I probably would have been thought, okay, that was good. Now I feel okay about it. Then you go and you play Purdue the way you did and said seemingly every reason to fold mm-hmm. late in that game for the variety of reasons, guys fouling out and t- calls going against you and other team making plays that are just that make you want to pull your hair out. You find a way. And then Illinois, you go toe to toe 
and you're still tie game with a minute to play or whatever it was that exceeded, I think what I was even uh, expecting, um, which, yeah, I think you have, I think you're right about the dog days a little bit, that it's a long season and these you, people kind of forget that it's a two semester sport. So it, they have, they have to go through final exams. They have to go through starting a new semester. They have to go through playing when the campus is empty for three weeks in early January. And really all they have is each other. Now they don't have class, which is nice, but they also are sort of isolated. And then you just have so many games and twice a week could be any day of the week nowadays, Monday, Friday, Tuesday, Saturday, that it wears on you. And there's a lot of travel and I, I'm not trying to get sympathy for these guys. Like that's not what I'm trying to do. And I'm not even trying to say like, it's, it's excusable to have losing streaks because they would argue it's not, but it does happen. And it's not unique to Wisconsin, you know, and, and it's not unique to this year's Wisconsin, even, you know, we, that's one of the ways I spin it. Right. I was go back and look at other seasons and say, okay, when's the last time here's a record book right here. When's the last time that they, do we have a losing streak and then round out and, and finish well. And, 2014 is probably the best example. They lost mm -hmm. five out of six games around the same period of time and ended up making it to the final four. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point, man. And context matters. It's easy to get become a prisoner of the moment like you lose to a Michigan team, Rutgers team. Um, but to pull it back out through Purdue, what I, I wanted to kind of ask you this, step back for a second. What are you going to remember about this team? I mean, obviously, March is still to come. You know, this, this story's not fully written yet, but – what is kind of unique about this version of the Wisconsin Badgers for you? Yeah, I hope I hope that my answer is going to be different in a few weeks. You know, what I'll remember about this team um, in a in a positive way. I think I really like the roster makeup of the like the composition of how this team was put together. Um, I was thinking about this 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 weekend about it that you have you have veteran pieces that have displayed loyalty and wanted to stay at a school. And in this era, that's becoming less and less like a fifth year wall and a fourth year uh, Crowell and a third year Hepburn of guys that are your building blocks that have stayed. Okay. So you've got that. You've also got imports. You've got transfers who have come in and owned their role and blended in really well, whether it's a star like AJ store or a starter who has his moments and is just steady like Klesmet or a guy like Kamari McGee, who, probably came here hoping he was going to be a star, but is now five minutes a game, but man, they're important and valuable five minutes. And then you've got freshmen and young pieces that are blending in really well with Blackwell and Nolan winter, and Connor season on occasion. Um, mm -hmm. So like, that's one of the ways that I will, re I think, remember this team is just the way it was put together that seemingly it's, that seems like the model. Like if you can figure out how to do that, if, Get old with some of your veterans. Import talent because you're always going to lose talent in this area. You're going to guys are going to leave, and and maybe not even because they don't like it. They just can find greener pastures. So import talent, and then keep the next level of recruits that you hope stay for a few years in the system, and keep reloading. Right. So in in, in two three years, hopefully Nolan Winter is that Stephen Crow that is the senior on the team, and then there's a new freshman that's coming in behind him. And taking that role and, and Daniel Freetag hopefully is the superstar, uh, you know, on, on those teams. And you can, and I, I'm a homer. Clearly I work for this. I work for the school and the team. I think Greg Gard's done a really good job of building this team. Yeah. Let me ask you um, a little bit about that because Blackwell coming in, you mentioned Blackwell. I, I've been trying in my head to think of a badger. He reminds me of, um, and Guard is a guy who won't always get a ton of credit on the recruiting trail, but John Blackwell, it plays like a four-star talent. I mean, he is uh, yeah. so advanced for a freshman. I think he's going to be a star in college over the next couple of years. I do too. Does he remind you of anybody? Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends of the show, Better Together. Listen, if your bracket's busted or you're tired of the same old, same old daily fantasy grind, try the social daily fantasy platform that's right with better together you can bet together with with your bros your friends your compadres your compatriots your amigos you can strategize together right play with your friends not against them you pick more or less on real-time player stats strategize with your partner to boost your odds climb the ladder board together so grab a friend and join the daily social dfs movement um 
Download Better Together now from the App Store. Sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over one thousand dollars in cash prizes. Remember the code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. Again, that is Better Together. Remember the code Locked On, and you can win a share of over a thousand dollars in cash prizes. Um, it is a ton of fun. You get to do it with your friends. Today's episode is also brought to you by our good friends over at eBay Motors. eBay Motors is the place to keep your ride or die alive. And, um, and people, the longtime listeners to this show, I, I, there's multiple times in my life I could have used eBay Motors. My One of my first cars, um, I drove it until it died. It had over 200,000 miles, and it just died in a parking lot. Literally, they could have done a chalk outline on it. If I had eBay Motors, I probably could have kept that sucker running another 30, 40, 50,000 miles. But I didn't have eBay Motors. I went to the other guy. And because of that, I didn't get the parts I needed. eBay Motors is there to give you the right parts, the right fit at the right prices. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. But you got to keep your ride or die alive with over 122 million parts. With eBay Motors, you are burning rubber. You're not burning cash. The right parts, the right fit, the right prices. eBayMotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nissan Motors. I think Michael Flowers is a pretty, you know, that's one that comes to mind. He's, he's a little different. He's a little bigger than Michael Flowers was, but he's got, he's got lateral quickness like Michael Flowers did to be able to be an elite defender, can shoot the ball. Flowers turned into a good shooter. I don't think he came to campus quite like John has. I mean, John right now has got the fourth highest three-point field goal percentage in school history for a season. That's crazy. Again, that's crazy. It's a, it's a small-ish sample size, but our minimum is you have to have at least attempted 60 to be in the record book, and he's got like 64 attempts. Um, I remember the first or second game of the year, I got a text message from Mike Kelly, who Mike Kelly may be the greatest defender Wisconsin's ever had. He's got the single-season steals mark, 95 steals in 2000. He sent me a text in the middle of one of our, one of our first few games of the year, and he's like, am I seeing this right? Is John Blackwell that good – defensively or am I am I overreacting because it's so early in the season he's like his lateral quickness is elite already and so and I was like I mean I think he's good but we'll see it was kind of my response but in my mind I'm going wow if Mike Kelly is identifying that after yeah. one two three games we might have something here I I think we do and he feels like another thing with his game it feels like he never takes a bad shot he doesn't make every shot but I don't ever feel like yeah. Ron Blackwell takes a shot, and in the head, you're like, no, 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 don't take that. In fairness, his role, if he did start taking those shots, he probably doesn't get to play True. much. <laughs> like, it's like fair. He, doesn't, he has not earned the leash that uh, A.J. Store or some of these other veteran guys has uh, have. Clearly, A.J. Store has that leash, right? Like, he takes some where you're like, eh. He takes a couple. Yeah, but he'll also take one where I'm, I literally go, no, okay, all right, he yep. made it. Like, I don't know how he got that done, but he did. And when he throws it off the backboard to himself to dunk, uh, and you're like, what? Oh, oh, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, it did work out. Um, I you feel like I, I, the point I made with Store. Store's a really interesting player to me because he's a guy. I know fans at times will get a little frustrated with some of the shot selection, but volume scores like him, talented volume wing scores have to take shots. They take tough shots. That's part of their. That's part of what they bring to the table, and they make a lot of them. That's what makes them special to me. Yeah, I mean, we just did a media availability here at the Cole Center just a couple minutes ago, and Greg Gard was talking about him a little bit. That he he called him. He said he's maybe the most improved player from game one to game thirty-five on the team. In in the way he's learned to identify shots, identify quality shots, because I think his quality of shots are better now than they were at the beginning of the season. He still takes a couple that you go, oh, I don't know, or he got a little three-point happy against Illinois, let's say, but it's less than it used to be. He's also learning how to adapt or like learning how to play sometimes in the middle of a game. Was it the, was it the Maryland game or the Northwestern game where his first two drives to the rim were kind of wild and, and, and he right. missed them both. I feel like that's the then, Maryland game. Okay. And then he, it's almost, and I think he got pulled. I don't know if they talked to him or if he just like recalibrated from then on, he started playing off two feet in the post. And I remember shortly after that, he had a jump stop guy went flying by easy lay in and it's like, okay, see, like he's able to even now diagnose it in game as it's moving. And I don't know that he was able to do that certainly before he got here, but even in the first few games. Um, so he's, it's, it's, he, he's a great player and he's getting better, which is fun. Does it, it feel like, um, 
Hepburn maybe I don't want to say turn a corner. Hepburn's been really good for three years. Um, yeah. It feels like he's playing maybe the best basketball of his his Wisconsin career during this last stretch. Is that a stretch for me to? No, I don't think it's a stretch. The Purdue performance, he he played Braden Smith off the floor, mm -hmm. and I think Braden Smith is really good. He's an All Big Ten, might be an All American point guard. He played him off the floor. He was way better than Braden Smith in that game. And that was maybe one of the better point guard performances we've seen in the last 20 years at Wisconsin of anybody. Um, that's how terrific he was of just all aspects, scoring when he needed to, distributing when he needed to, being a menace on defense, poking the ball out, drawing that charge late, taking over at, at crunch time, not just the game tying basket, but he had another one in overtime where – down three, like, all right, let me just go at it. Like, we're not going to settle for a three-pointer here. Like, mature play. He was asked today in media about about that, about being more assertive or maybe being more aggressive, finding his role late down here in the season. And and he he kind of cagey gave an answer about just smelling blood in the water and wanting to just be a – just basically, like, be a killer down the stretch here. And um, he has a bad taste in his mouth from two years ago when when he got injured, couldn't finish that second round game against Iowa State, and the team really kind of floundered a little bit without its point guard. And um, he's – it's cliche to say, like, he's on a mission, but kind of is. <laughs> well, that's actually a really good point that I hadn't thought of, right, because he, he goes out of that game with the injury. I think we, we beat Iowa State. I do too. We were leading when he went out. We were leading when he got hurt. And then we, I, I don't even do – would Wisconsin even score 50 points in that game? Like we just no, offensively had no flow second half. I feel like it was like 54 to 49, right? Something exactly like that. Exactly what it was. It's exactly what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like we got our, we got our uh postseason media media guide here ready to go. So well, and that team, you know, you and I talked about this the first time you were on the show, and it's there comes to be a point where you do just have to win in March, right? There comes yeah. to a point where people are like, all right, enough is enough. But that team, man. Pepper gets hurt. Johnny Davis wasn't hundred percent. Nobody will ever tell me he was hundred percent in that run either. That team was really good with all the pieces and they could have made a run. Um, and yeah. it's just a footnote. It's basketball, right? Like, you know, we, one of those final four runs, I'm sure Arizona's sitting there going, yeah, I mean, but Tarnuski this and that. And like, yeah, that was our team. We should have won that game. And we probably would have won the national title that year. Like that's, that's basketball. Wisconsin, unfortunately has a, a lot of painful things like that. I, I think about the loss to Florida in Madison Square Garden in 17 and the Chioza shot, right? Like that's so painful. That team goes to the Final Four, I think, if they if they beat Florida because they had, they play South Carolina next, who's a who's a okay South Carolina, not like offensively challenged. I think they might go to the Final Four the year before that when they lost to Notre Dame and had a late lead. That was another one. Like they, North Carolina was waiting, and I thought we actually matched up okay with North Carolina. Um, just get the ball in bounds. Like, don't turn it over on the, you know, it's yes. funny. Yeah. 2014. Oh, dude. You beat, you don't lose, you know, you lose that game. You play UConn in the championship, like a six seed UConn. Like, but that's basketball. Like, that's what makes it, that must make the tournament great. The best teams don't always win. This show is taking a painful turn. Um, <laughs> listen, I had Vito, more about that Purdue game. You know, Vito Brown was on the show really quick just to go down. And I talked to him about that Florida game and his head just sunk. You can tell, like, oh, Vito? You said Vito? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. and some people just never get over it. Like I think fans are the same way. We don't get over that stuff too easily either. Um, yeah. And that was the last game of his career, so like that's just doubly painful. Like he had no chance to mm -hmm. make amends. Well, he fouled out towards the end too in that game, if I remember correctly. So like he wasn't yeah. out there at the end. Uh, go back to the Purdue game because one thing, a point I've made, and, and listen, I'm not here to to fully be a homer either, right? This team had issues at times this year. It's not perfect, but the point I made is they've kind of stayed the course like the the culture on this team there's teams that fold i guess is my bigger point when you go three and eight there's teams that fold when you know social media is yapping and i'm i'm talking about how frustrated i am after a loss like there's this team i think that's the sign of that leadership you talked about with hepper and it's the sign of mm -hmm. you know building that roster with the right mix of people um because they never folded um each week we're picking one team that stands out one team that's pushed it just a little bit further than the rest just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The Auburn Tigers, they can only be described as a pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch, and they've really created a lane for themselves that they're claiming the top spot in the SEC. They knocked off the Florida Gators in the SEC tournament, 
and they are set to make a run in that big dance that everybody cares so much about. Um, just like the Auburn Tigers, just like the Nissan Pathfinder. If you want the perfect ride for your family to find the adventure, to find out what's what's around that next corner on the road, you are not going to go wrong with Nissan. And they're all new 2024 SUVs, the Nissan Rogue, the Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada. Take any of those. Go find your next big adventure. Wherever life takes you, Nissan will get you there. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Go find your next big adventure. Yeah, I think so. I agree. Um, and I, if you look at like, yes, the three and eight stretch or whatever you mentioned, like to, in totality, like dude, that, that looks ugly. And then, but then if you, like, if you dissect it, the Rutgers, the get lost at Rutgers was bad. They got, they got blown out of there. The loss at Michigan is probably pretty inexplicable, right? That's a, that, that they would all tell you, like, you can't lose that game. That's not a good Michigan team. Aside from that, there were there were razor thin margins where they probably came out of the Iowa game at I the loss overtime at Iowa or Nebraska going, ah, like we blew a chance there, but yet it wasn't like, Whoa, we're not any good. You know, what I mean? do you know what I mean by that? And some of the, some of the other losses in there were Purdue twice. Well, okay. You, we played Wisconsin played Purdue really well. So again, I don't think they came out of those games going, cow, we're you're questioning yourselves. Like we stink. They lost to Illinois at home. Illinois is really good. So I think that probably helped buoy things a little bit in the locker room that it wasn't this prolonged, like bad loss after bad loss to bad teams. If that, if that kind of makes sense, like we're getting blown out, we're getting blown out. It was a little, it, the vibe was a little different. And then I don't think you can undersell how important turning the page to the postseason is like being able to say, okay, that season is done. Now the Big Ten tournament starts and it's everybody's zero zero and you start over. The pregame vibe before playing Maryland on Thursday was hilarious. Like I, I walked through, kind of passed through the locker room as the guys were getting loose, and they only have 25 minutes to warm up because uh, we were the second game of that session. So you don't get much time on the court to warm up. So you kind of have to do a lot of your stretching and your pregame things in the locker room or in the hallway by your locker room and kind of get creative. And so they're in there and you probably saw the boom box all weekend oh, yeah. long and that kind of stuff. And, and from, but from the first game there against Maryland, they were, they were loose. They were having fun. They were enjoying each other's company. They looked like they were playing with no pressure. Like what the hell, man, let's just go. And I contrast that to last year where they went into that big 10 tournament uh, playing on Wednesday against Ohio state and desperate, like yeah. neatly, like we're fighting for our lives. We need a win and everybody's grasping really tightly. And they just, they got paralyzed and they started really poorly and lost that game obviously. And, and had no chance to play way back to the, to the NCAA and had to go to the NIT. And I, I, th I just contrast this year to that year and, totally different vibes I felt like. And I, to me, it's not coincidence that they went out there and played really well for four straight games. I hope we see the same thing in Brooklyn. Not, and not to ask to, to divulge anything behind the locker room, but how healthy do you think this team is right now? Cause it looks, every, nobody's a hundred percent healthy, any team at the yeah. end of the basketball season, but how healthy do you think we kind of are right now with what you're able to share? They'll be okay. I, I, I'm, it, it was a concern all weekend because, you know, Hepburn missed a game and, Tyler Wall was 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 obviously hampered a little bit, and Klesmid, and maybe John Blackwell wasn't right, and maybe Kamari McGee wasn't right. Getting to play on Friday of the NCAA is enormous. Mm -hmm. Like that, when when that I, I fist pump when the bracket came out for the biggest reason was that we got a Friday site and not a Thursday. So getting that extra day. So yesterday the team was able to take off. They came in and they uh, they did some scouting and video work, but they didn't. No practice. Today they didn't do any possessions, any live possessions. So they're able to really back off the miles that are being put on these guys. And I I'm not as concerned about injuries as I maybe was Saturday morning, right? Like before the before that Purdue game going, okay, we're we're we're, we're wounded warriors. Um I think that I mean you're right though. No, nobody's hundred percent, but the I think we'll be all right. Really quick, uh that's because I want to ask you some football too. And again, I'll I, with a guy like you, I'll run out of time before questions. But I, I, I give my answers too. Oh, you give great answers, man. I mean, people really enjoyed your feedback on the first one. Um, how excited are you to never play Zach Eady again? 
Oh, enormously. Oh my gosh. I think big pair refs are gonna be happy he's gone too. Like I don't that they don't know how to call it. And so I, uh, very, very I, I'll be very happy to not see him anymore. Well, no, that I take that back. I would like to see him again because if we see him again, that means that it'll be the final four. Yeah, it'll be in the final four. I'll that's take fair. that. No, I'll that's take fair. that. So and I would I I'm to say it right now, for the record, I would like to for the Badgers to play Zach Eady one more time. But only one more time. <laughs> only one more time. Yes, that, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I, no, I, know, I, he's a I, terrific I was, player. He's a terrific player, but I think he's really hard to referee. And I I, I give I have empathy for the referees because I don't I think that it's a really hard thing. Teams bang on him, but he clearly gets away with some things. I I don't know. I, both the both the game at Purdue on last Sunday, and then the and then the one in the Big Ten tournament. There's some plays where you're just like, I don't, I don't get it, I don't get it. It's but. it's incredibly hard. Like refereeing in general is an incredibly incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, having been involved, having refed a couple, like it's really hard. But yeah, it's that's a tough one. Uh, let, and let's. I, uh, we're, I can no, no, go ahead. Yeah. Also, the way the the rules have changed too on some of the. The player control there. There used to be more player control fouls called than there are now. Like I watch, you watch what Terrence Shannon is. It, it does for Illinois, and and AJ Store actually does some of the similar things where he gets downhill and he will just go mm-hmm. and he will force the issue and force and put the referees in a tough spot of like, well, you're gonna call something and they don't call charges anymore, so I know I'm gonna get the call as the offensive attacker, and you know, there were. The, the frustration becomes when the consistency isn't there, right? Mm-hmm. But it is, it, is, it is a hard job. It is – if you ever get a chance to sit and, like, really close to one of these games and see the physicality and how fast and big they are, like, it, it's remarkable the, to figure out what you call and what you don't because there's so much contact all the time. And you can't call everything, otherwise the game's unwatchable. Well, I think that's some of the frustration, though, right? It, it is the consistency because – it's Big Ten basketball. They're physical. They're big, and then it feels at times like they are calling just the slightest touch, the slightest bump. And yeah. uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of if you remember the Seahawks when they had the Legion of Boom. I don't know if you're an NFL guy, but they had, they Pete, uh, Pete Carroll actually said we we're really grabby, uh, but it's because they can't call everything, right? They'll call one here or there, but if you consistently do it, like a Shannon or or like you said, a store will get downhill in the paint too. Yeah. Eventually, you are going to get your share of those calls. Um, I used to think Purdue used to play like that. Like they don't need more of it. Ten years ago, I feel like they used to say, "We're going to follow you." Like uh, the hand checks out on the perimeter, we're going to follow you every time because we're going to bet they're only going to call twenty. We're going to follow you sixty-five times, but they're only going to call twenty, and that's to our advantage. Back when and like Rayfield Davis, go down there, yeah, like Chris Kramer era, and like each one more like that era. They would just they would just dog you, and it worked. They were good. They were tough. Yeah, Rayfield Davis was on those teams. Like they would yeah. just get all over you. Yeah. Um. Let me ask you this really quick before you shift the football. What are your expectations for this weekend? I mean, I don't know if you're a guy who makes picks or, or what do you, what do you think? My bracket is empty right now. I got nothing on yeah. it. I haven't, I haven't filled it out. I will fill it out. I love. I mean, I'm like I'm. I've been doing it since I was six years old. So I'm a kid at heart, and I have got two sons. And I'll we'll do it tonight. We'll all fill them out and look at them. What are my expectations? Um. I think Wisconsin is a better team than James Madison. So if they play, if Wisconsin plays well, they will win that game. Um, doesn't mean they can't lose. I mean, that's what we love about March. I think that the Duke game, a, a matchup, a potential matchup with Duke, is very spicy, uh, and it gets me really excited. The, just the thought of it. Um, I think Wisconsin would give them all they want. Let's put mm-hmm. it that way. I think. Duke's good, uh, but that that name means something around here. And I know none of the guys in the locker room now were uh, around in 2015 and probably uh, here in 2015. And they weren't mo- a lot of them weren't Badger fans in 2015, but they know the history well. They know the 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 allure of Duke. They know they don't. They know that they didn't get a scholarship offer to Duke and. Um, I feel like if Wisconsin gets a chance at him, I uh, I would I would not be surprised if Wisconsin beats him. So and then beyond that, they, if they'd have to play Houston, I don't know. That's you got to play well, but 
Sweet 16, you got to play well to beat anybody by that level. Yeah, I agree. And a lot, there are a lot of edge fans that were a little frustrated about the draw. And I just feel like in March, there's no easy draw in March. There's easier draws, harder draws. But, like, you got to be good teams to advance at the end of the day. Um, yeah, nothing- you think people are more upset about James Madison because maybe they were underseeded or or a second-round matchup with Duke? or like, What are you I- hearing about that? Because I'm just, just curiosity. I, I got instantly a DM from somebody that said um, – James Madison is is a nightmare for us because they shoot the ball well. Um, yeah, another DM that literally said, I've watched James Madison a couple times. I wish I hadn't. So I think there's a lot of concern about James Madison, which, listen, that they won 30 games. It's a good team. But if you're a five seed, you're going to play a tricky game. 12 seeds typically are tricky. I, you know, that's kind of how it works, typically. Um, any t- I mean, any team in the field could probably beat Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. I mean, truthfully, if they played every team 10 times, they might lose to every one of them at least once in there, right? Okay, could happen. But one of the things I found interesting, I was was looking at this last night a little bit. So James Madison has one win over a Ken Palm top 100 team, right? So uh, one top 100 win of the year. It it was a good one. They won at the Breslin Center of Michigan State. Like, they're getting a lot of credit for that, people. It's always the first thing people bring up. James Madison, ooh, they could be in a Big Ten team. They proved it. Uh, Yes, they did. Game one. Michigan State went one for 20 from threes in that game and missed 14 free throws. I, I'm a little bit, I guess, taking away from James Madison here, but that, it's not necessarily my intent. I'm, but I'm saying – so that that you should know that context about that. But that's their one win of our top 100. Okay. How many top 100 wins do you think Wisconsin has? Five? 17. 17. So, again, James Madison very well could win. Like I'm, now I'm probably setting this up and Wisconsin falls and the people say I'm an idiot. Um but to say James Wisconsin should be scared of James Madison is probably irrational when you think about it in those terms, right? That James Madison has one quality win. They have three one top 100 games, and they went one and two. They beat Michigan State on the road, and then they lost to Appalachian State twice. Those are their three top 100 games. And Wisconsin played 22 top 100 games, or no, 28 with top 100 games or something like that, and won 17 of them. Yeah, I think so, I'm quad one wins. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You no, you're right. They had five quad one wins. I'm just talking. Yeah, so I'm expanding it a little bit. Oh, no, but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good point. Um, I don't know. So, it, all that being said, I do think James Madison's good. You don't win 31 games by accident. Wisconsin can't play their C minus game and expect to win. They have to play a B or even better an A game to get out of there. But I think Wisconsin's best is good enough. Wisconsin's best beat does. Here's a question for you: Does Wisconsin's best beat James Madison's best? Yeah, I think so. I, okay. I think I think there's I, I think so with James Madison in the front court. They they have two six nine guys. Their bicker staff is six nine two twenty. I mean, we've seen Stephen Crowley. They're, they're quick. quick. Like, that that's was one thing that maybe would give me a little bit of pause is that they're yes, you would hope offensively Stephen Crowell could could feast a little bit and dominate and be physical. Defensively, that can paw that mm-hmm. smaller quick guys can can cause problems um, for any team if you you know, just with the way they can work and stretch you out. So that's one thing that that's an interesting, that'll be an interesting matchup to kind of see of size versus size. Well, I'm curious too. the other point, And then I promise I'll get to football for a minute and let you go. I've got, I've got nowhere to go. Okay. My, my bags are packed. We're ready to go. I feel yeah, guilty, I'm, man. I'm ready to get on the plane. <laughs> but I, think, I think this works for stores advantage to a little bit because he gets to the rim so well. And without a seven foot guy down there, a six eleven mm-hmm. guy down there, yeah. I think his ability to get in the paint, get to the line, uh, this would be one of the smallest front courts he's had to finish against. People only think of the, the post players. I think it's going to help store quite a bit. That's a good point. Yeah. God, now I'm feeling even better. Let's go. go. Let's go. Put, put that bracket together. Let's go. <laughs> uh, let me ask you about football quick. Um, spring practice starting. We, we talked about football a little bit on your first time on the show and just kind of the hype of last year and, and what happened and where we're at and Luke Fickle. Um, one of your quotes that I really liked was he's a lot more stake than sizzle. What's the vibe right now around the football program? Um. Excitement, uh, but but work, like work. Um, there is a there is an emphasis being put on having to like you can't take shortcuts. Um, how there's a there's a big saying in the locker room: how you do anything is how you do everything. Sorry, yeah. So and the point being, every little detail matters and if you if you take shortcuts on the small details 
then you're likely to probably take them when it matters most and when you're doing other things. And so there's, there's this men trying to instill this mentality within the program of, of being present in what you're doing and working hard. That said, then there's also a blend now of returning guys who kind of emerged as last season went along. You think about like Will Paulings and Jake Cheney's and some of those guys that, that as last season unfolded, they kind of started to rise and then there's a there's a big influx again, and that's this program does not want to live in the transfer portal, but I think they feel like they have to right now to build the team the way they want to in the short term, and so several different position groups were really rebuilt. I mean, the linebacker one's probably the most obvious that they really rebuilt that room um, with an influx of guys that are a little different maybe than we had on the roster the last couple of years. And I don't mean to disparage any of the past guys, because there's a lot of different ways to, to do it. And clearly defensively prior to last season, Wisconsin was elite, but some of the new players are a little longer, a little more athletic, a um, little bit, maybe more apt to play in space. Um, and that's a little bit, I think the direction they want to go. And so that's brings excitement too of like kind of this newness of a lot of transfers, a lot of early enrollees. I mean, we had a huge crop of early enrollees that are diving right in. And some of these guys are going to make impacts. They're going to be, we're going to, some of the guys in that early enroll group are going to play this fall and not have to, well, we'll wait, we'll see them in three years type of guy. So vibes are good. Vibes are good. They're excited. They've been, I think they're itching to actually get some practice time in. And unfortunately the schedule is weird. They'll, they'll, they'll start on Friday with the first practice and then it's spring break on campus. Mm -hmm. So they will take a full week off uh, and then they'll resume again that early April with their other 14. You get 15 practices total. So they have one early, take a big gap, and then 14, bang, 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 bang. What about uh, – and I know fans have, have kind of fretted uh, – fretted is the wrong word. Talked about this, been concerned about it a little bit. Some of the coaches leaving, right, obviously Michigan came in, Alabama came in. Um, internally what, what what is your thought process on that what would you maybe say to fans not that you need to say anything to fans but um it does feel like a lot of turnover a year after bringing in a new coach even though i know every coach is unique and has its own kind of specific story there yeah what's what what would feel better losing a bunch of coaches after year one or losing coaches after year four for example what would be more alarming i don't know i i, I kind of just thought about that like what would i would that say something more that like they stuck, they were there for a while and then they didn't like it or like after one year said, okay, well let, let's, let's find another option. And okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get the guys here. It might take one or two or three years, but we'll, then we'll get the right team assembled and then we're going to go as opposed to you just hope I would hope that this isn't a every year, you know, you're having this turnover, but I will say that's sort of the culture we've created now in college athletics. You've got athletic directors leaving their alma mater at Nebraska to go yeah. to Texas A&M to a new situation in the middle. You've got running backs coach at Ohio State who'd been there for over a decade leaving after a few spring practices to go to Michigan. You've got players, athletes transferring with no penalty anymore and just up and leaving for better offers or greener pastures. So – I, I feel like because it's us, because it's Wisconsin, it's maybe feels alarming or geez, what's going on there. I think it's more a product of the collegiate athletics that we've created and not we being Wisconsin, we, the NCAA, the greater, the greater, co the greater collaboration of teams. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. That Alfred move is wild. That, that would be like losing a coach that had been in Wisconsin for a bunch of years to Minnesota. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that is wild. Um, what? Well, yeah, it, it is interesting. Last question I, I have here, and again, I've already kept you for six minutes more than I, I promised I would. Um, and I meant to talk about this in basketball, but the portal opening up in basketball, obviously, right now. How how fair is that? Fair is the wrong word, but obviously teams are still playing. Gray guard has to. How can a coach and a coaching staff possibly evaluate these players, continue to manage the roster while you're preparing for March? Yeah. I mean, general thoughts on that. It feels like the schedule is really tough on coaches. It is. And, and football in December was not unlike that, where you're preparing for a bowl game and you're and you're also having to manage your own roster that you still have, try to retain players um, or counsel them and then also get new. Okay. And the high school, 
But right now in basketball, yeah, the portal opened up yesterday. And I don't know what's fair because is it fair to make a team whose season ended? Is it fair to make um, um, who's a Big Ten that, that's not playing in the NIT? Uh, so Michigan. Michigan. Um, yeah, is it fair to make Michigan sit around for a month and like watch their players basically tell them, hey, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, and they can't start building? I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. Greg Gard was asked about it today, and he said – they they are they're involved in the portal right now. They have to be like they have to be. They and they don't even know what their roster is going to look like next year. They, they he's not talking to his guys right now about hey, are you going to be here next year? And you're not going to have that conversation at all. And but inevitably, it seems like this era of college athletics, one or two or three or four or five, whatever, you're going to have some players who decide to move on to different opportunities. And so you, but you don't know that yet. So he was saying that, you know, his, he's got assistant coaches who are monitoring it all the time now. And they've got a, they've got a transfer portal text chain that they, Hey, Hey, this guy's in, should we, should we reach out? This guy's in, uh, what do we think of him? And it's not every time he's had a joke. He's like, it's not every time a, a name goes to the portal because there were 500 yesterday. So we don't know, we don't have that many text messages, but when there's somebody that, that they think is important or has a relevant connection to us or a coach or here, a teammate, um, then they're then they're exploring it already. Last year, when Wisconsin was making that NIT run, they had guys come on visits while the team was still playing. So they, they had a, they had transfers come in and sit and watch practice and talk to the guys. And one of those guys might be taking one of those guys' spots. Like that's just a weird dynamic. So wild. Um, and they'll have to do that again if Wisconsin advances out of this weekend and makes it to Dallas next week. Who knows? Yeah, maybe they'll bring somebody on campus for a visit who's a transfer that they're not even sure they have room for. I mean, so it it it's interesting, um, but I guess it's why they get paid the big bucks. They can they have to juggle a lot of things at the same time. I mean, that would sure be easier to sell, right? You, you, if you're, if you're still playing. Yeah, it, by, by being in the NIT last year, you know, taking yeah. your visits. Now you're you know it's certainly be easier to sell, and it feels like. Um, great guard actually hits pretty well in the transfer. Like you look at a Kamari McGee, um, a Max Klesman, uh, a store, a Chris Vote, a Micah Potter, right? It, yeah. It like he has a really unique eye for finding that the right culture fits and players that can help. Yeah. They're selective. They are. And I, I, both ways selective on maybe saying, okay, let's, this Chris Vote is a guy that, that we we don't need a 30 minute superstar. We need a 10 minute guy. And how do we find that piece? And so selective on maybe finding guys like that. And then also selective on, well, that guy's a great player, but is he going to fit? And is he going to, is he going to come here for the right reasons? Maybe we don't want that guy, even though he's, he's the top of our board from skill standpoint, but no, not the right one. Um, but I think you're right. I'm glad you brought up like Micah Potter as one too, that I think people would definitely would kind of forget about because it was before the mm-hmm. transfer portal era. And so I think you the, but if you but you do have to expand the sample size a little bit to learn about it. And I also hopefully, you know, we've done a good job of retaining guys. There have been exports and there are guys that have transferred out, but not many of them have transferred out to another big program and excelled. Where you go, man, I wish we had that guy. That's too bad we lost that guy. That that will happen at some point. I'm sure it does to everybody, but. Um, you're having a lot of guys that are transferring to maybe smaller schools to get more opportunity. And that's, that's one of the great things about the portal is to give those guys, look, it's not so, uh, so it's not so-and-so's fault that they got recruited to Wisconsin and aren't good enough to play there. Right. So mm-hmm. go to find another school that you can excel at like a Andy Van Vliet, if you remember that name, right. Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Not Andy Van Vliet's fault that he got was recruited to Wisconsin. That's great for him. Didn't work out. Went to William and Mary and had a couple of good years there, and maybe maybe that was the right level for him. And now he's still playing professionally, so that's a good side of the portal. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. Um, he is Patrick Herb, Wisconsin Director of Communications Brand Strategy. As always, humbled to have you on the show, man. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. People, people are smarter because you're here. So uh, <laughs> I don't know about that, but well, this is well safe. you know what? How about we do this again, like in two weeks, and we talk about maybe a final four run for the Badgers? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Dude, if if we're if we're trending that way, yes, absolutely. I mean, I would love we'll to have you one. on no matter what. But we'll do this live from where's the final four? Phoenix. We'll do it. Maybe we do it live from Phoenix. 
Dude. You might have to come out there and do it in person. Can like can I get a, like a media pass? Can I get out there? We'll talk about that later. We'll figure it out. Um, Find a way to get you a media pass. We'll figure that. Out. Okay, let's take let's take care of James Madison first on Friday. <laughs> exactly, because that that five twelve C can always trip somebody up. Uh, he is Patrick Herb at Patrick Herb. Uh, safe travels to Brooklyn, my friend. Uh, thank you again for jumping on the show, and we will definitely talk later. Thanks, Ryan.